Um, I usually like to start talks with introductions and acknowledgments. So by way of introduction, I'm Mitchell Kravietz Thayer. Uh, thank you again, Sarong, for the introduction. Um, also credited heavily for this talk is Neptune, who is the co-founder and data curator of Nonsense Research Lab. Uh, the two of us have been working around the clock for the last couple weeks trying to churn everything out. A lot of this research came together in the last week, slides in the last couple hours. So uh, thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, also, thank you, Monero Research Lab, like my second home, uh, enjoying Conferenzo. And then lastly, if there's anyone from XMR chain, I'm sorry, I kind of abused your API a couple weeks ago. Uh, <laughs> so we set up our own like private blockchain explorer now, but I was kind of hard on that when making plots for this graph. So thank you for the role you played in this presentation. Oh, and Serhak for helping out with infrastructure. Okay, so the outline for this talk, uh, really quickly, motivation, intro, et cetera. And then I'm going to talk about three different heuristics for tracing Monero. Um, the fees actually applies to other privacy coins. Um, yeah, so I'll just move through it. Where do I point this? Is it this way? Okay, cool. So the motivation for this talk and the motivation for sharing these heuristics with the community is strictly to keep Monero users safe. That is always the like beginning and end goal of my research. So during this talk, my goal is to inform best practices for users, hopefully there's some takeaways for you, and then also to inform best practices for software creators in designing wallets that are compatible with how uh, the reference is set up. So uh, kind of in short, the aim is to design protocols that enforce best practices by identifying and preventing anomalous behaviors. So, Talking a little bit about kind of fungibility and the Monero ideal, the goal is always to have 100% of transactions and outputs be effectively indistinguishable from each other. Uh, so essentially we would have a single anonymity pool. Uh, quick side note, I'm gonna use the terms transaction and output somewhat interchangeably during this presentation because if you have a weird output, your transaction looks weird and vice versa. Um, so you can just kind of gloss over that. Now, uh, from a statistician's point of view, we actually have one big anonymity pool that contains most of the transactions, and then there's several smaller, I call them anonymity puddles, that are subsets of transactions that don't blend in with the rest. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about three different ones, uh, all around like order of a percent. And the good news is, all of these can be fixed at the protocol level. So I will also be presenting possible solutions for these. Uh, of course, I would never unilaterally make a consensus protocol change, so this is all just opening up discussions that we can have in the community over the next couple months. So just so no one freaks out, if you're using like custom or common software, you're probably in the main pool, so like don't worry about this. I'm really just focusing on edge cases in this talk. Okay, so let's do a little bit of just kind of basic introduction to transaction analysis. So I'm making like two simplifications here. One, just to make the chart followable, is I'm using one in, one out transactions. Uh, normally you have one or more inputs and uh, we believe that all transactions should have two or more outputs so that it looks like a recipient and change. This actually isn't implemented at the protocol level yet, so there have been about 2,000 transactions with a single output, but hopefully that'll be changed in the next upgrade. And then I'm showing ring size three. At the moment, ring size is 11, uh, but just makes the diagram possible to follow. So let's say this blue dot is a Monero output that we've received, and as a recipient or uh, an external blockchain explorer, either one, I want to investigate where it came from. So because we have ring signatures, it doesn't just say, oh, it hopped from here to here. There's actually three possible histories, uh, three possible places it could have come from. So maybe I wanna look another layer back. Where did these three come from? Well, there's three more histories. Where do these come from? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is the ideal of Monero is anytime you go to look at where something came from, there's a whole bunch of possible histories and this just kind of fans out going backwards. So these blue circles represented the ideal where we have this 100% indistinguishable anonymity pool. Now I'm gonna introduce red squares, which are the transactions or outputs that have distinguishing features. And there's many possible types of fungibility defects that can show up in privacy coins. So one of them is when we had an, an anomalous ring size. So you'd have people that are using uh, ring size, you know, 40, 50, thinking that they're being sneaky, but it just sticks out of the pool when everyone is using seven. Uh, this was fixed in version eight. Ah, thank you. Um, another one is the transaction extra contents and metadata. So this has been discussed during the um, conversation around deprecating payment IDs 
And then also Neptune is currently doing an analysis that has turned up a lot of really funky stuff in Transaction Extra. Um, so some duplicate payment IDs, some really weird stuff that actually bypasses the length of the field, all kinds of strange stuff that um, once we finish that up should be public soon. Uh, one I mentioned earlier is anomalous transaction structures. So if you have a single output transaction, again, hopefully we'll remove those in the next upgrade. And then one of them is anomalous fees, which I'm gonna talk about during the first portion of this uh, presentation. This one actually applies not just to Monero, but pretty much any privacy coin, uh, both crypto note and otherwise. Then I'll talk about uh, transactions that ignore the unenforced lock time in Act 2. And then lastly, I'll talk about incorrect ring member selection in Act 3. So what I'm saying is that there's a lot of different ways that a transaction could stick out and be a red square. So what happens when we come across these? Well, and if I have one of these red square transactions and I look back, I'm probably gonna find a similar one further upstream, uh, if nothing else because of change outputs. And okay, so the probably came from the red, but we don't know, right? It's like one in three. What if I dig back a little bit further? Okay, so now I'm starting to see a chain. And of course, occasionally you have just random ones that are picked up as decoys. But if you really start pushing back through the transaction tree and you see a string of these transactions or outputs with fungibility defects, you could start to statistically infer uh, the true flow of funds. So this is kind of the mental model uh, that we'll be looking at moving forward. And when I refer to anonymity puddles, I'm basically talking about where we have a bunch of these red transactions sticking out. Okay, so act one is unusual fees. Uh, so people who use the core software have probably seen this screen where you can pick a slow fee, a normal fee, a fast or a fastest. And what ends up happening there is Monero has a dynamic fee market. It's really cool. I won't go all the way into it. But basically, there's going to be based on uh, you know transaction traffic, block size, whatever, uh, kind of like a reference fee. And then you can take different multiples of that depending on if you're in a rush for your transaction or if you're, you have plenty of time. Um, and so what you'll see is that most users fall into one of these four bands. They've selected, using the core software, a normal fee. Now, very quickly, I just wanted to highlight uh, that there's some unusual, some unusual fees that show up a little bit. So if you look at this plot, the x-axis, sorry, I'm used to walking, so let me figure out how to introduce plots without. So the x-axis is showing the fee that was attached to a particular transaction, and the y-axis is showing how many transactions used that fee. And this is showing all ring CT transactions since its introduction uh, up through May 2019. And what we see is that the vast majority of users pay almost zero or you know, a very small amount, amount of fee. Fun fact, there are actually two ring CT transactions that paid zero fee, but that's a whole other issue. Um, if we look at the same plot on a y-axis, or a log y-axis, then we start to emphasize the little kind of odd things that happen out in the long tail of the distribution. And so I just wanted to share this to note that there's someone who has paid like seven, 10, and 12 Monero fees. Not sure if that was on accident or if they were in a really big rush. I haven't totally dug into that. So next we're gonna look at uh, how fees have changed over time. So I'm gonna show you the x-axis being all ring CT, uh, blocks that contained ring CT Tan Jacksons. And then the y-axis is the absolute fee in micro Monero. And a couple of things pop out. So first of all, we see that there's different fee levels. Um, and so you have where there's the lowest priority, medium high priority, and most transactions showing up in these lines are probably using the core software or one that has implemented the correct fee market. Uh, does anyone know why there's that drop off just before block uh, 1.7 million? Bingo. So this is exactly where bulletproofs were activated. And since transactions got smaller, uh, so the fees went down dramatically. And I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's actually cool. If you zoom in, you can start to see uh, the lower two bands creep in a little bit before the mandatory uh, cutoff as people uh, adopted and upgraded their software early. Okay, so now we're gonna look at the first anonymity puddle. Uh, there is some particular piece of software that attaches a fee of exactly 0 .002 Monero to every single transaction. And this makes a very small anonymity puddle out of uh, 
what is that? I guess 3.7 million Ring CT transactions, about 100,000 of them use this exact fee. Uh, so that's a little unusual, and those transactions kind of stick out if you have this red trace going back through it. Uh, I switched the color scale to a log axis so you can see a little bit more of what's going on here. Uh, so this is the same plot, but just kind of emphasizing the low noise. You can see that we really don't have this simple picture we would expect of just having you know low and medium um, transaction priority. A couple things that jump out is some of this fanning is actually probably due to different size transactions. So if I have a two input, two output transaction that uh, you know, I would attach standard fee level two. That's going to be a certain amount of Monero. But if I have the same priority level on a two in, ten out transaction, it's going to have a different absolute fee. Okay, so to kind of deconvolute that, I've now switched the y axis over to relative fee. So this is micro Monero per kilobyte of transaction size. And the picture is pretty interesting. Again, you can see where there's kind of your different priority levels. And uh, I think that's the lowest and the medium one. And then there's some fanning out at the end. I'm not 100% sure about this. I think that might be fee sniping. So if you think about it, if the block is getting completely full or say 80% full of transactions that are paying fee priority two, and you wanna get one of your transactions in the next block, you have a couple of options. You can either pay uh, fee priority two or you could pay effectively 1.1, and then you jump in line from everyone who's paying the single, you know, one priority. Uh, so you uh, basically sped up how fast do you get included in a block without having to pay up to the next level. Now, the last kind of puddle like this that I showed was on an absolute fee, but we also see some people that have hard-coded software with exact relative fees. So here's another anonymity puddle where the fee was specified out to, I guess that's like eight significant figures, uh, which is a little bit overkill. Uh, and these are 22,000 transactions, again, out of 3.7 million, so it's a very small anonymity puddle. And just to kind of draw your eye through the issue and kind of realize how fractured our fees cause our anonymity pool to be, if you just start at the bottom of that, of that white line and kind of count your way up to the top, you pass through like at least four, maybe five different anonymity pools. So the default ones, you have the static ones, you have some super high ones, you have all these outliers. Uh, so that's, I would say, not ideal. And this is all just high, it's because we have these very high resolution, many significant figure fees that we then have all of this information leakage or the ability to leak this information. So my proposal, uh, a possible solution, and there are others, is that transactions would only be valuable, uh, sorry, valid if the fee is an integer power of two. And so what I've actually done here is I've taken all of the real ring CT transactions, so 3.7 million transactions, and then I've retroactively rounded it to the nearest power of two. And now what you see is you still have a fee market, right? People can still pay more, pay less, depending on block size, depending on how fast they need to be in there. But we've now really limited like how much you can allow your software to be fee fingerprinted. Um, this could be applied to either the absolute fees or the relative fees. I don't have any particular thoughts either way right now. And the funny thing is that this actually reduces transaction size because you're going from uh, you know, many significant figures to just specifying an integer. So kind of conclusions from this part are that we have four separate anonymity pools based on the fees. There is the correct reference pool where people have just selected priority level one, two, three, or four. Then we have people that have put a fixed absolute fee, for example, always .002 Monero, which we saw earlier. We have people that have hard-coded a fixed fee per weight, uh, for example, .01 Monero per kilobytes. And then we have outliers to the above three sets, right? This is all about partitioning your anonymity pool. And so I can partition some out, then I'm effectively also partitioning the other ones. So one of my main recommendations is eliminating high precision fees. Um, so again, makes it smaller, less info leak. Uh, and just a very quick detour, fee fingerprinting can be combined with other heuristics. And in fact, basically any heuristic can be combined with any heuristic. It's one of the tricky parts about this. Uh, one example is timing analysis. So going back to this plot, uh, when I was originally pulling it down, I zoomed in on the last couple weeks, and lo and behold, I see two things that jump out. So, you know, you have your low fee level, your default fee level, and then you have these transactions that are happening very periodically with a high fee. 
And I actually went through, looked at the transaction tree topology, and sure enough, you can just trace right from one to the other. So this is, I wouldn't even call it an anonymity puddle, it's an anonymity drop, and it's just So uh, this is just kind of a general reminder to also be careful about periodic timing. Okay, so act two, I'm going to look at juvenile ring members. So for this, I need to do like a brief introduction to how decoy selection works. So let's say that I have a whole bunch of blocks from 2017 up through 2019, and I want to spend some fund that is the green dot. My wallet is going to go out and pick a whole bunch of decoys, which are keys that do not belong to me, but I grab the public key and I mix it in when I construct the signature. And so they're going to take all of these, the true spend and the decoys, they're going to mix them in the ring signature and then deposit the transaction as a new output. Now, the only part that observers can see is this outside portion. They ostensibly don't know what the true spend is. Uh, they can just see what went into the ring signature. And so one of the things you can do with that from an outside perspective is you can look at what is the youngest ring member between when the block was, uh, when the transaction was mined and then the earliest uh, youngest ring member. Uh, just kind of hopping into it again, this is, thank you XMR chain, I scraped like 400,000 signatures. Um, so most of them fall within a very young range. If uh, we look at the three month line, 99.7% of transactions have a very young, youngest ring member. And then there's this weird outlier with 0.3% of transactions uh, that use a different algorithm. So again, I've switched to a log Y scale. So you can see a little bit more of what's going on. Uh, on the left, you see the correctly constructed transactions. And then on the right, there's a couple different anonymity pools. I'm not going to split them up here. Uh, but you can see that there's some odd things happening. Now, one of the things that was interesting is I was, wanted to look at, OK, well, we have a 10 block lock time. So the youngest ring member is going to be at least 10 blocks, because that that's when you can spend your Monero. Um, and then let's see what the distribution looks like from there. Much to my surprise, there are, are people that are overriding the 10 block lock. That is in the reference wallet, so the core software considers your funds unavailable until 10 blocks, i.e. 20 minutes-ish has passed. 1.6% uh, of transactions actually bypass that and have ring members that are even younger. Uh, so this is again a very small anonymity pool. It's a very um, kind of strange behavior. Um, I looked through, again, I kind of scanned the transaction tree topology myself. And a lot of times you can see this again where you just see it would hop every one or two blocks uh, straight across. So there's a, oh, switching to a heat map, I wanted to know was this little spurt from a one time event or is it constant? And what we see now, the x axis is time, uh, several weeks. And then the y axis is what was that youngest ring member? And none of them should be less than 10, right? It should just be black below the 10 line. And you see that kind of throughout, we have had uh, people making these juvenile transactions. Uh, here it is with the log scale. Okay. So my conclusions from this uh, observations is that the vast majority of transactions uh, or the anonymity pool follow this 10 block lock time that's in the reference wallet. A minority of ring signatures include members that are less than 10 blocks old, which really sticks out. Uh, my philosophy is that protocol should enforce privacy relevant reference issues. Um, if it's important enough that we code it into our wallet, we should also code it into our protocol. Um, and so there's kind of three options here. One is that we add that 10 block lock at the protocol level, so we would reject transactions that are younger than that. Uh, another option to make it match would be to remove the 10 block lock in the reference wallet, or there could be some compromise where we go to say five blocks, but it's also enforced in the protocol. Uh, my inclination right now is number one, because there has not been research showing that lowering the confirmation time is safe, so uh, that would be my like conservative recommendation. Oh, earlier today I actually had a fourth option, which was, what was it? Oh, yes, that we could, thank you, that we could keep the transactions that have juvenile ring members in the mempool and not mind them until enough time has passed. Uh, that would be good for someone doing uh, retrospective blockchain analysis. It would not be robust against an adversary that's running an archival network. Oh, and a quick note, this is unrelated to buyers permitting zero confirmation purchases. If uh, you buy a t-shirt for me and I'm like, cool, five bucks, I'm not worried and walk away, uh, that's fine, that has nothing to do with protocol. Okay, quick note, I think the 10 blocks was chosen arbitrarily. Is this optimal? I'm not sure, out of scope of this talk. Let's research it.
Okay, act three uh, is egregious decoy selection. So the standard best practice for selecting your decoys is to pick several of them from recently, and then you have kind of a couple of longer ones further out. And the logic behind this is that most transactions occur, or we, we suspect based on spend time analysis of other chains, that uh, most outputs kind of churn relatively quickly, and so you also want your decoys to be relatively recent. And you also want some long tails so that if someone has to spend an old output, they have cover for that. So this is the right way to go. And it's really bad practice to use uniform random decoy selection. So if I just pick 11 random members over the course of history, um, so kind of like get a mental image of this. Green dots are good, red dots are bad. Great, okay, it's quiz time. Uh, who thinks A was generated correctly? What about B? Does that look right? What about C? What about D? Okay, pretty much everyone got that, right? A and D are wrong, uh, or generated with a different algorithm, and B and C are regular. And my point here is that just because something is non-deterministic does not mean it is non-verifiable. You all just very intuitively did this. Uh, a quick way to kind of uh, make a statistical metric out of this is the median is convenient. So in a set with 11 members, your median is going to be the sixth oldest. And so if you look at the median on these, the ones that were generated correctly tend to have a median that's relatively close to today. And ones that were generated uh, using a uniform decoy selection, they're typically much further out. Again, not to scale, it is actually much more dramatic difference than this. So if we look at that median, um, back to what outside observers can analyze, median ring member age is the sixth ring. And I'm gonna use what I call the offset corrected median age, and I'm going to ignore the length of time up to the first uh, ring member. And that's to allow people delayed broadcast, right? I generate a transaction, I don't have internet access for a day, and then I broadcast it. So since that offset is ignored, you can, you can still do that. Okay, so let's look at the offset corrected median age. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's the x-axis. Main thing we see is that because most people use the correct algorithm, uh, most of them are very short, right? 99% of people use the correct decoy selection algo. Uh, if I put like a 500 day mark, you can see that there's a couple people doing strange things out there. Uh, once again, I won't dig all the way into this, but you have the regular anonymity pool on the left and you have several small anonymity puddles on the right. Uh, just looking at it on a log-log scale, so now the median age and the counts are in log scale. Uh, this big bump is transactions that were generated using the correct algorithm. Uh, it's pretty clear, I think, at this point, even just intuitively, which ones we could rule out as being kind of oddly generated. Uh, I really like heat maps, you may have noticed. So kind of looking at how this evolves over time, the x-axis is height, again, equivalent to time. The y-axis is this kind of offset corrected median metric. Um, and just to kind of put some guides on this, the bottom row is one day, one month, one year. And you can see that the kind of big yellow band in the middle is the main anonymity pool. You want your transactions to be in that anonymity pool. Uh, anything that has a kind of strange decoy selection that's out past a month, out past a year, is definitely not using the standard algorithm. So these ones out here that are like 500 days old, um, very peculiar, there are some other heuristics that opens up, uh, so we want to avoid that. So the conclusions there, uh, the vast majority are using a plausible distribution, uh, small anonymity puddles use distinctly irregular selection, often that's uniform, uh, but there could be other kind of wonky things going on. Uh, I believe the offset corrected median is a robust method for identifying the worst offenders, which are the biggest privacy leaks, so these ones that are like 500 days old. My recommendation is that the consensus protocol could reject transactions whose offset corrected median age is more than some threshold. And a very lenient threshold would be about 500 days, which is so absurd that it would never reject a properly constructed ring. Uh, you, we could actually plausibly put a more strict standard, uh, but I didn't want to go down the rabbit hole of parameter selection during this talk. That's the conversation we'll have in the upcoming weeks and months. Uh, so I'll move on from that. <laughs> so then my closing thoughts, kind of high level. One, visualize your data, leverage your intuition. Uh, it's really hard to stare at just a text dump, but if you can import it into Python, make a couple quick plots, you'll have way more power in interpreting what you're looking at. 
So my advice to privacy protocol engineers is enforce necessary best practices in the consensus rules. Don't just hope that all of devs match the perfect reference implementation. Uh, it's a complicated thing, right? There's a lot to get right, it's easy to get stuff wrong, and it would be helpful if the protocol actually rejected things that were wrong to help wallet makers debug, troubleshoot, and get their wallets working correctly. Privacy coin software developers try to match the reference wallet. Um, and then like an approximation or a simplification, like just grabbing uh, random decoys can leak a surprising amount of information. It can be kind of insidious and you often don't notice it until you visualize it. And then for users, uh, use a community vetted open source wallet. See the Monero sidebar on Reddit. When in doubt, use the core software from Get Monero. And if you're curious, you can look at your transaction on a block explorer. Uh, I've actually done that. If I'm like trying a new piece of software, I'll go take a peek at it and just look myself. Did it use the correct algo? Did it set a normal fee? All of that. So in closing, uh, first I want to thank Insight. I run a professional training program there to help uh, basically professional software engineers, academic researchers, and hackers transition into a full-time career in blockchain engineering. Uh, and they actually sponsored me to come out here, uh, so thank you very much. If you would like to be in our next cohort, applications are open, I think, for another week, but we'll be running a full session, hands-on, in person next September. And also, Nonsense Research Lab, all the supporters there, uh, much appreciated. And now I will open to questions. Uh, there's my email, and all of these slides and code will be available at k2019.nonsense.org. I've uploaded the slides. Uh, I'm going to sanitize the code a little bit, and then I'll put that up in the next couple days. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm curious as to who you think the worst offenders are. Is it wallets, exchanges, miners? Um, who do you think is actually doing this uh, weird, you know, decoy selection or um, confirmation time? You know. Good question. I don't have any definitive answers. So, with regards to the fees, I could see that being a whole bunch of different parties. Um, with regards to spending faster than 10 blocks. I haven't the faintest. I would imagine, so uh, in the last couple weeks there were like the order of 10,000 transactions, so I don't think it's like one person or a very like small, I don't know if it's one of the, some website, some exchange. I actually don't know why an exchange would need to bypass that. That wouldn't make sense. Uh, so I'm not sure. I have, I've been digging around just doing the analysis from the blockchain perspective. I haven't done any matching back to real world entities yet. Thank you much.